my laptop <laughs> and let me just show you my studio. Okay. So here's my printmaking studio, part of the studio. Here's my wonderful etching press. Ah, yes. So here's where my music comes from. <laughs> you know, it's just got everything under the sun here. And here are some of the papers that I paint that become my collage. Nice. And here is used to be my welding studio. And now it's my painting studio. Look at, I love those paintings. They're just like coming through. Exactly. Look at those colors, they're beautiful. It's all color, Gosh. cosmic color. And this one I'm, I did for the Afghan souls mm. that couldn't leave. And yeah, so like here, that's the little darker ones are from that, but I'm not staying there. I'm going here. These, this is brand new. Whoops. These are brand new. And this is also, it's called Left Behind. That is beautiful. I love that. I love that, that image coming through. Um, in the, and the dove or the bird. Yes. Oh, love it. I love that. Oh, thank you. So here's another one. And, and there are just a zillion of them. And I'm also still doing monoprints. Let me just hold this one up. <laughs> nice. So yeah, you know, I'm 85 years old. And I'm feeling we're never old, mm -hmm. you know, and I, I like what you said about hope. So mm -hmm. shall I, why don't I just bring this one upstairs? Okay. And we so, can talk more about your, about hope, because what about spirit of hope? Right. <laughs> That's actually the title of my memoir. I know. <laughs> and I'm going to show you, I mean, without hope, right? Mm -hmm. We, we can never lose hope. I mean, I am hopeful. I may not get to see the changes I want to see, but I think even if we go through dark times, that there's always the light that comes through that Leonard Cohen talks to us about. Yeah. So, oh, what happened? Looks like these lights went out. Okay, they're back. Okay, here is... Can you see this? Yes. I have to go away, I think, a little bit. So this sculpture I had given to my former husband. I don't think it's properly coming in. Yeah, we can see it. I did it in 1967. And I asked him to give it to me to fix up because he never showed it. And uh, I'd have to clean it up, which I did. I mean, it's my daughter's. It, I mean, he was gonna give it to her, so I did it for her, but she hasn't taken it yet. And here's another piece from that early, early, early time. Oh, I love your masks. Uh-oh, we had a little freeze. So a lot of the paintings, you know, have a surreal sense until, you know, here, I'm, here's, here's, here's one, here's, let me come back here. So this was one of the first ones that I did. Mm. And so now, you know, can you see? Absolutely. It's like, it's hard to describe. It's like if you're meditating 
you know, and looking out, I, don't, I just get third eye vibes. <laughs> just really I think, I think that I meditate when I, when I work. Yes. Always, yeah. I think. Mm -hmm. So he is the spirit of hope. Wow. That right oh, yeah. Ooh. Tell me a little bit about this one. Um, I, here. I did it. I did it the year I was having a retrospective at Silvermine. Mm -hmm. I can't even remember what was going on. But in the front, it says, I am the spirit. And in the back, it says the spirit of hope. And, uh, you know, I think that people need to know that even in the darkest times, mm -hmm. um, what you do then, <laughs> it opens your next life. Absolutely. Okay. Well, I have a question for you <clears throat> because we talked a little bit about the pandemic, right? And is there anything that you could share that you were kind of um, thinking on or, you know, how you got through or what kind of things were coming up for you during the pandemic? I'm, I'm, I'm just going to bring this into my office for a minute because I that I hadn't experienced before. I mean, it was, it was strange, actually. Oh, it says my internet connection is unstable. Why should that be? Okay, now I can hear you and see you. And what, so I missed your last part. What were you saying? Oh, okay, let me go into the other room. One second. During the pandemic, I was very much alone on, to, to a degree that I think in some ways match the experience of that silent time in my marriage, the time when you have these young children who you really can't have much of a conversation with. And uh, that especially in the time, you know, after my child died and, and my daughter was born, I, I had this feeling, you know, that I was being supported, spiritually supported. But during the pandemic, the solitude was so deep. It was beyond anything I had ever experienced because it was constant. You know, it was all day. It was all day long, mostly day after day. I mean, I didn't go food shopping. People brought it to me. I didn't go anywhere. I mean, I went for a walk and... It, um, in Florida, I could swim, oh, but then they cut, they shut down the pool, right. so I couldn't even swim. And it was, it, it was like entering a, an unreal world. It was like entering, I'm trying to find a word for it. It was entering a realm. Hmm. That I, I, that I was unfamiliar with, except that I will tell you that when my second child was born, the one who died of that fatal genetic disease, uh, the placenta didn't come out and they put me under. And I had an, a near death experience. I didn't know it was near death. It was only when I was in India years later and I read about other people having this experience out of body near death experience. But I went into this tunnel mm -hmm. up into them. And um, I was given the answer to the secret of life, <laughs> which was pretty exciting. Yes. And I didn't want to come out. 
But I wanted to tell my husband the secret of life. I mean, wouldn't you? <laughs> and they pulled me out. I mean, I felt, I mean, obviously they took out the placenta and that must have been what I felt pulling me back. And I felt, I think, you know, especially being as elderly as I am, that I was, I was, um, I, that my sense of the physical world was that there was a layer beyond there mm. that I was feeling. Okay. And as I had mentioned, I started painting again because usually I do printmaking at Eckerd College when I'm in Florida as a guest artist, but because of the pandemic, I couldn't go. Mm. And so I started, I mean, I always paint, but usually my paintings take two or three years. So I started painting the very day that Biden got elected and nobody killed him because we were worried. Yeah. And as soon as he got in office, I literally started painting. And my painting was a celebration. I have it over here. It's what I call it, the tree of life. It was, you know, great relief. I, I, it's so hard to know, you know, if I'm showing. Can you see it? Absolutely. There it is. So that was the first one. And then the second one was more mysterious, but I think it, it hit more this otherworldliness. And then they started to loosen up and become more and more and more and more color. Yeah. I think I'm just going to sit with this on my lap. <laughs> but I have no light, so it's not going to work. Um, well, take your time. I want you to get to a spot. I don't want you to have to you know, be uncomfortable carrying your computer. Um, well, you know, I want to show you this mask. Oh, yes, yes. Let's see. Can you see this mask? Oh, it's that called one. Mahakala. Mm. Um, my last, terrible to say, but my um, a gallery that, that handled my work for over 20 years has closed. Uh -huh. <laughs> and I have, I have outlived a lot of the people who used to show my work. <laughs> And so this that piece came back very bent out of shape. And I was so worried, how would I ever fix it? And uh, the gallerist really worked with, you know, UPS to make sure that, that they would play, pay the claim. And I thought, you know, if I have to heat my torch, I'll have to refinish the entire piece and it's just not going to work. So I, once everything was cleared, I started bending gently and moving and shifting. <laughs> and then I put the mask on the floor and the sidebars, they're over 200 years old. They were given to me by a friend who lived in a very old house and he had dug up in the, his backyard, uh, I guess what had been a, an old carriage with wagon wheels and things. Yeah. And so that I was a little worried to put my feet on those sidebars. But when I did, <laughs> I straightened the piece out. And I did it in 1975. It's a very powerful piece because I, was a, I had just finished writing The Art of Welded Sculpture. It was just published by Van Osten Reinhold. And I was going around the world for a year because of the wonderful United Methodist women. Peggy Billings found me. They brought me to um, Oklahoma to perform for the Quadrennial Women's Conference and give a workshop, yeah. a couple of workshops. And I was so impressed that these farm women and Sunday school teachers, who I certainly never encountered in Queens, New York, were so receiving 
and so revealing of, of their inner stories that I thought, I need to take this around the world. Yeah. And a- after I performed Sarah and Hagar, David Bedell, who worked for the United Methodists, asked me, he said, this is very powerful work. What do you want to do with it? And I said, I want to take it around the world. <laughs> and he said, well, go talk to Peggy Billings. And she mentored me for the solid year, mm-hmm. taught me you know, how to network in ways that I hadn't known, and arranged for a grant that you know, paid for quite a bit of the trip and residencies in Korea, in India, in Japan. Wow. And because, and then I, you know, went to other sources through the through the performing, and you know, and had a residency in Greece, in Israel. I performed for the United Presbyterian Women at Purdue. It was an audience of five thousand people, and of those people were were women from around the world. And I had somebody at home who I had hired to, you know, write, keep up. And, and, and she got me a connection with the, with the Egyptian Feminist Women's Union. <laughs> and these were women, they were, they were like Gloria Swanson in, in Sunset Boulevard. They were heavily made up because the first wave, you see, the freedom was to make yourself up. The second wave was the freedom to take it off. <laughs> so, you know, they were marvelously heady times. But you know, this, the amazing thing is that those heady times didn't end. You know, when I, when I organized the Women's March in St. Petersburg, I mean, that was, I didn't expect to do that when I was 80 years old or to turn 81 on the very day and have 25,000 people sing happy birthday to me. But I also developed a mask tail with a paper mask. You know, it, somehow or other, hiding part of your sale, face yeah. and speaking the truth is very powerful. So I haven't stopped. But now I'm painting, 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 painting. And it feels... You know, there are times that you know. I mean, like you said to me, how did you know, you know, to jump into the women's movement? There are times when you just know this is for me. And regardless of anything else in your life, you have to do it. So I did. 